Thank you for your patience. We would now like to start the open webinar on the second Sino-Japanese for reassessed. First of all, we will hear from the Director General of uh, JAYA, uh, Director Tomiko Ichikawa, please. Good morning and welcome to the seminar and the second Sino-Japanese -Japan war reassessed. On behalf of these organizers, I'd like to say a few words at the outset. The Second Sino-Japanese War was the longest one fought by modern Japan. The war has casted a shadow on the issue of the recognition of history as well as Sino-Japanese relations. Multifaceted understanding of this war based on historical fact is needed. With official archives having been opened by several authorities in recent years, progress is being made in reassessing the war from various perspectives. Thus, at JIIA in March 2020, we originally planned to organize the symposium with the cooperation by the Institute of Modern History, Academia Seneca. However, due to COVID-19, we had to postpone uh, the symposium and the eve of the planned uh, date, as we could not have uh, the clear uh, outlook or the prospect about organizing symposium in the original format, with the understanding gained from the experts uh, that were originally scheduled to participate, uh, we finally decided to organize this event and uh, remotely. I'd like to exp express my appreciation to all those who gave us a kind cooperation, including Dr. Makoto Kawashima, Dr. Huan Tzu Chen, as well as the other experts who would be part of this program today. Today, first we will hear from uh, two experts representing Japan and Chinese Taipei, followed by comments by experts. A through discussion and the report that reflects recent development on the research of the topic that is in question, Hope that uh, this would be the opportunity for you to have a better understanding more comprehensively on the Sino-Japan War. Uh, I hope that uh, that would be the case uh, with this uh, symposium. Thank you very much, President Ichikawa. So without further ado, let us start the webinar. And we have as uh, the moderator, Professor Shin Kawashima of the University of Tokyo Graduate School. Professor Kawashima, please. Thank you very much, Kawashima speaking. So as uh, uh, Director Ichika has just mentioned, we had been cooperating with uh, the uh, Institute of Modern History, and we had wanted to have a face-to-face -face physical uh, web seminar, but unfortunately, it could not happen. Therefore, uh, this December, we decided to hold this online. And uh, that being the case, uh, Japanese side and Chinese Taipei side, uh, we have uh, the leading researchers of this field, and uh, we have Dr. Huan Tzu Chin from the uh, IMH Academia Seneca, and then from the Japanese side, uh, Professor Hatono. And I think uh, you know uh, that uh, with regards to the uh, Japanese understanding of China, he has done, been doing research and uh, also research on Chiang Kai-shek. And uh, he is quite knowledgeable, especially also after the World War II, the relationship between Japan and Chinese Taipei. We'll hear from Dr. Huang and then uh, Professor Hatano. And then we have uh, discussants, uh, that is uh, Professor Iwatani of Hokkaido University and Professor Mori of Doshisha University. So Professor Iwatani is uh, doing research on the Marco Polo Bridge incident, and uh, he is engaged in advanced research. Professor uh, Murray will be uh, taking up uh, the history of uh, the Japanese army. He is uh, doing uh, research in broad areas, and we have high expectations for the two speakers. We don't have much time, so first we'd like to ask uh, Professor Huang.
Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, today, I am going to raise three issues. In other words, uh, after the Manchuria incident in Japan and uh, China, there were various uh, incidents, and we are going to study Chiang Kai-shek's uh, response. And uh, to be specific, the uh, first the Shanghai incident, the Rehe campaign, uh, the defense of the Great Wall, Tangu Truce, and He Umezu assessment, and Marco Polo Bridge incident. Uh, we would like to look at the uh, Senkai Hesek strategies uh, for these incidents. And secondly, over uh, these incidents, what were the factors leading to Chiang Kai-shek's responses? And the third uh, issue I would like to raise is uh, at the time of the Marco Polo Bridge incident, what was the reason uh, that uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek stopped uh, the position of uh, making compromises? And after the Manchuria incident, we have the so-called uh, uh, Anne Zhang Wai uh, policy. Anne Zhang Wai can be viewed from two aspects of the internal affairs and foreign affairs. In terms of the internal affairs, it was to uh, expand the basis of control of the central government and eliminate the opposing forces. And in terms of foreign affairs, how to avoid the war with Japan and uh, uh, he has expectations that uh, uh, Japan and the Soviet Union, uh, Union would uh, enter into battle while uh, China uh, was patient. And this is a map of uh, China in uh, February 1933. And as you can see, the national government at the time, in terms of uh, nominal terms, had uh, uh, control of 24 uh, provinces. However, of the 24, 14 were in a semi-independent state, meaning that uh, they had a certain uh, finances. And uh, so actually, it was only 10 provinces that was being controlled by the central government. And uh, you can see uh, the white are the uh, semi-independent. And uh, uh, so it was uh, around the uh, area of uh, Changjian uh, that was uh, uh, under uh, the control. However, in this area, too, the uh, Communist Party had some uh, control. So it was uh, only uh, the th uh, three uh, provinces that were under the control of uh, nationalist government. And uh, so, uh, so uh, he wanted to have uh, full control. And also, in the past, where he had control, he, he wanted to eliminate the communist control, and unless that was done, he felt that he could not uh, build the uh, national unity type of uh, uh, preparations for the war. So that was uh, his reasoning. And uh, also, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, in terms of foreign affairs, well, he had viewed Japan from the perspective of the national defense policy after 1931. Uh, the uh, f Far East, uh, uh, you have so the Union and the uh, Manchuria. And so uh, he knew about the, uh, their forces in 1931. Before Manchurian incident, there were six only six divisions, but uh, in 1936, uh, it, it spanks the 16. And then 1931, for the time being, or from 1932, 200 uh, Air Force uh, uh, units were uh, present, and also for the tanks. And in 1932, 
there was only 20, 250, but uh, in 1936, it increased to 1,200. 1, so uh, from the perspective of Chiang Kai-shek, the Japanese structure centered on the emperor system could not coexist with the communism. Uh, so in terms of the hypothetical enemy, uh, it was clear that they were the enemy. And that meant uh, uh, that uh, uh, the enemy was uh, the Soviet Union. So the North China issue is only one part of the uh, war against uh, the Soviet Union. And the contradiction there is uh, uh, bigger. So if uh, China uh, persists and is patient, then he felt that Japan and Soviet Union would enter war the war first. That is, uh, if you look at his diary in October of 1933, it's clear uh, that is in October, there was only uh, 31 days, but uh, he it talks about uh, uh, the possibility of war between Japan and the Soviet Union on 12 days. So that uh, uh, he felt that Japan and the Soviet Union would go to war first before uh, China. And also, in uh, on December 31st, 1935, if you look at the diary there, that's the end of the year, and uh, he uh, summarizes the negotiation with Japan of the year. And he had uh, uh, two uh, uh, thoughts. One is that in the Northeast, the Chinese sovereignty, if Japan would admit it, then there could be an uh, allied relationship with Japan and the uh, South uh, uh, Northwest, uh, the uh, ter railroad could also uh, be uh, opened up. That was his intent. Uh, however, the sovereignty in the Northeast, if that was not uh, approved, then uh, that was okay. But if they could uh, stop the separation movement of North China, then it would be possible to resume the Sino-Japanese relationship, and there could be a certain economic ties. So he had such flexibility because he wanted to avoid conflict with Japan. In other words, there was a common interest, and there was still possibility that uh, the two countries could uh, cooperate. Uh, so. If you think about his policy, what's most important is that uh, he was anti-communist, and that was the common interest between Japan and China. And so he wanted to uh, uh, be uh, quiet. And in 1933, if you think about the Shanghai incident, uh, then you can further understand that. Uh, if you look at the newspapers, the uh, Shanghai incident is between the Japanese army, the, the 19th, and the battle with the 19th army. In other words, the Chinese people at that time didn't know the Central Army had uh, been was in battle, and uh, the Central Army was participating. And if you look at the Japanese newspapers, uh, the Central Army, on at the time of February fifteenth and sixteenth, had uh, been uh, committed uh, to the front. However. They were using the 19th Root Army number, and therefore uh, this was not known. And the, on February 22nd, uh, the Japanese uh, Army got the testimony of the prisoner. And uh, uh, so until that time, uh, they did not know about the uh, commitment of the Central Army, so that uh, it appeared as if it had he had not entered into battle. 
and in the defense of the Great Wall, it was uh, seen in his uh, political intent. And uh, we took up uh, three days in terms of his uh, uh, diary, that is uh, the December 29th diary of 1932. Internally and externally, Communist Party in the basin of Changjiang should be wiped out and uh, there has to be a uh, the political situation in the uh, a good political situation in the influence sphere and uh, in if it cannot be helped then after the uh, communist party in Jiangxi is uh, purged then uh, the northeast uh, problem could be resolved and then on January 4, 1933, the Japanese army is satisfied having uh, uh, gained uh, Manchuria, and uh, they are afraid uh, that uh, China may retaliate if there is a world war. Therefore, they are trying to uh, subdue China to make it an ally of Japan and uh, to uh, defend against the Soviet Union. And also, uh, there is fear about uh, the Soviet Union uh, teaming up with China, and that's uh, leading uh, to this uh, will to subdue China. And then March 14th, uh, 1933, the diary says that uh, with regards to the territory lost in the Northeast, the League of uh, Nations would be relied on, and there could be a resolution through political means, not through force. And if uh, in uh, China the Japanese army takes the offensive again, uh, then uh, there would be a full uh, force resistance. And uh, so how we understand it is that his uh, Anne Rangwai policy uh, differed depending on the region. First of all, he, he uh, emphasized most middle China and then north China and then the northeast. So that being the case, uh, the middle China was most important because that is his base of activities. And so this uh, uh, core uh, foothold was being threatened by uh, the Communist Party. That means they are the biggest enemy. And basically, he wanted to protect the middle China. And with regards to Northeast, he did not want to use force to recover uh, Northeast. And with regards to North China, uh, the uh, use of force is the final uh, means. And uh, therefore, he wanted to use the diplomatic means because uh, there was still uh, room for uh, the uh, cooperation. So without using force, he wanted to have a buffer zone in uh, North China and uh, to have uh, a reconciliation. And that is specifically is seen in June 1933. Uh, political Affairs uh, Readjustment Commission is established, and this uh, uh, commission, uh, having uh, the diplomatic rights or uh, the responsibility, and uh, he uh, sent a telegram to Huang Hu in uh, September 29th, 1933, and uh, Huang Hu, he could use his own human network and uh, uh, to protect the uh, sovereignty in uh, uh, North China. And Huang Fu, in the Meiji period, was uh, 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 in Japan, and he could speak Japanese. And he had a good relationship with the Japanese people. And uh, he's from uh, Sekjang. Se Se and uh, so, uh, with uh, Chiang Kai-shek, he uh, became blood brothers. However, uh, despite being from the south, he was uh, living in Beiping, and therefore he was uh, revered by the bureaucrats there, and uh, even uh, became prime minister at one time. And 
he was uh, uh, understood to be most uh, pro Japanese. And in fact, uh, what was done through this uh, political affairs, the adjustment committee, the it was also communicated to uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry of Japan through a one food network. Uh, the they didn't want to see the uh, the fall of uh, the Chankajak government, and uh, that was not to the interest of Japan either, because uh, the for China uh, for Japan the stability of Manchuria uh, was uh, uh, the utmost important, and therefore the, it was useful for Japan to uh, defend the sovereign uh, sovereignty of J China. On the other hand. By utilizing one who the in northern part of Japan, the there were uh, was an interest uh, seeking for the independence. And uh, during two years of this uh, committee and political affairs, uh, there was a stability between uh, the uh, Manchuria and uh, the northern part of China. The railway uh, was uh, there in operation, and the mail delivery uh, was in operation as well. And uh, whether the the there was not that uh, strong interest in the uh, independence, and eventually in 1935 on May 29th, the there was this. Uh, the Umezu Hu Enchin Agreement, according to which the, they discussed that the northern part of China be separated from central China, and with that, for Wan Chan Mei. Uh, made a proposal that is in northern part of China, uh, this semi independence uh, should be recognized. And according to that proposal, in 1935, on 11th of December, so a political affairs committee was established. Which is a new organization to respond to the uh, the demand by Su Chen Wan, and and this was created uh, through the uh, the army and central government. But uh, eventually, it was Chiang Kai Shek and Kenji Hara, uh, Doi Hara, Kenji Doi Hara. Uh, that uh, eventually decided uh, establishment of this organization. That is, uh, the, this committee uh, consisted of members uh, jointly selected by Japan and China, and uh, this was recognized as uh, the independent uh, autonomous uh, organization in northern part of China, recognized by Japan, and that uh, the autonomy was recognized in Hubei and Chahar. And thus, out of rivalry uh, within China, this region was created, and uh, Sun Che Yuan was there. He had his own army as well as his own financial foundation. Uh, he was a mediator. Uh, between Japan and China, that was what. That is why he had that inf uh, interest and influence, and he was satisfied with the status quo. But then, as a result of uh, that, uh, the the compromised relationship with the uh, the Chan Chan Army, because in Hubei Province, he wanted to. Seek for support by Jianjin Army, and eventually the relationship between Jianjin Army and 
As soon as Taiwan uh, deteriorated on the contrary, the relationship with the Kuomintang government was improved. And uh, therefore, at the time of the, uh, the Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, the, there were four parties that were there in this uh, political affairs adjustment committee. In May 1936, it was Guantan Army that was involved, but then it was uh, the, the Tianjin Army that uh, became more influential, and then there was the other uh, Japanese uh, government, and and then, then the Chinese government and Su Chen Yuan. Uh, thus, there were four parties that were involved there. So I would say that uh, there were two major groups. The Kuomintang and the Tianjin Army uh, were concerned about the status quo, well as uh, in the case of the uh, Sun Chen Yuan and the Japanese government, uh, they were uh, they wanted to maintain the status quo. So there were two parties. Uh, one wanted for the stability of uh, the status quo, and the other were concerned about uh, the situation there. As a result of the conflict between the two groups, in fact, uh, for the Japanese government, uh, they uh, attempted three times to mobilize Japanese army, but then gave up on those three occasions. They didn't want to see the, uh, the expansion of the Marco Polo incidents. They were satisfied with the status quo, but the Kuomintang government was not. Therefore, by taking advantage of the Marco Polo bridge incident, the Central Army wanted to move toward the north. The, according to Umetsu and uh, the who into an agreement, the Hubei, that is, a northern part of China, they, they, they used to be involved in diplomatic relationship with Japan, but then after Marco Polo Bridge incident, Chiang Kai-shek denied that, and therefore, uh, the, the instability that was derived from that incident and became uh, the cause of a conflict. Now, looking back again, why is that the they became so hardlined? Well, for a long time, to some extent, uh, he was successful for the preparation for war. What's most important was that in the Yunnan and the Sichuan, the provinces, they were semi-independent, but uh, he wanted to drive uh, the Communist Party there. And also in the, the Guangdong, as well as the western part of China, were against the central government. But then, the uh, back then they were integrated uh, into central government, and after Xi an incident, the new uh, form of collaboration between the the Kuomintang and the uh, Communist Party was born. That is, with that, uh, the there was the possibility of the war again, and therefore. The 14 provinces that were semi-independent, the, there was some ex influence to some extent by the central government. And the, the back then, the influence of the Communist Party was uh, eliminated to some extent. And therefore, with that, the, he thought the, he could fight war against Japan. And at the same time, he expected that he could postpone or delay the war against Japan, but in 1936, 
the wide expansion of uh, the uh, the the Germany uh, aggression uh, that resulted in worsening a uh, relationship between Germany and USSR, and therefore that points to uh, the the need for cooperation between Japan and USSR. Therefore, what he expected for a long time that uh, the, the war between Japan and USSR uh, there was th that uh, possibility became remote, and therefore if I put a conclusion here for Shanghai Shek, well, depending on the time, uh, the, his policy of Anai and Wang Wai was different. He was for, his, uh, the priority was a first and central China, northern China, and uh, then uh, the the area where the first battle of hope was fought for. And the, there was uh, some relationship with the Communist Party. And he, to him, the the territory, the where Communist Party had an influence, uh, was overlapping with his own territory. So that was his core territory. He wanted to defend that at all his cost, and therefore, for Chiang Kai Shek, fundamentally. Uh, the, to him, the boundary was uh, the Great Wall. That is, he was not thinking of uh, the recovering northern part of China with force. He lost uh, the northern part of China. That was because he was not interested in uh, the conflict uh, with Japan. But Japan was against the communist. Japan could not coexist with communists, so that uh, he, thus he thought for the possibility of partnering with Japan to defend against the communist influence, and he was expecting the joint uh, the the battle between Japan and uh, China against uh, the USSR, and thus if there is a buffer zone. And then he thought uh, that, that they could coexist with Japan. But for a Japanese army, especially those that were dispatched uh, to a uh, continent, China, the, so far the puppet regime was uh, at the interest to be established. And uh, with that, he thought uh, the sovereign right of China could be maintained. But eventually, Japan became interested in uh, controlling a ruling Jianqin and Beijing, and therefore, uh, that with that, there was no longer room for uh, compromise and cooperation with Japan. And, and also, there was another reason uh, he was already prepared for national unity. That is why. Uh, with this, I'd like to conclude my lecture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So the Chiang Kai-shek administration and his uh, perspective. After the Manchurian incident in 1931 and the Marco Polo Bridge incident, what was uh, Chiang Kai-shek's strategy was reported. And uh, there is the so-called Anne Rangwei policy, and uh, you he has you have looked at uh, the inside the country and outside the country in the Anne Rangwei, and then after the incident in, in July 1937, uh, this policy was shifted. And I think that uh, he uh, reported on in-depth research. And with regards to Anne, there may be a difference in space, but uh, uh, communist parties 
uh, with regards to the northwest, uh, the control expanded, and then Canton, and also uh, with, with regards to the uh, coast. Uh, Guanxi, uh, it was okay uh, to expand uh, that territory. And also there was Soviet Union and relationship with Germany and uh, 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 possibility for Japan and Soviet Union to enter into war. And Chiang Kai-shek's response, it was not ad hoc, but it was based on the long-term strategy. Thank you very much. Now we'd like to go on to hear from uh, uh, Professor Dr. Hatano uh, from the Japan Center for Asian Historical Records, please. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry I was late. So I have a cold, a slight cold. Therefore, I have to ask uh, for your forgiveness in wearing a face mask. And uh, first of all, the uh, Sino-Japanese War and uh, research on uh, this war. If we look back on the past 10 years, there is a revolutionary history and the history of resistance. There's now been a big change from that. Rather uh, diverse uh, views are being studied. On the other hand, uh, the research on the military operations uh, is a bit low key. And therefore today, uh, the stage of the Sino-Japanese War was not just the continent, but also uh, uh, affected the Southeast Asia. So that uh, the two uh, battlefields of the conti continent and Southeast Asia are often uh, debated separately, but actually they are closely related. And uh, for China, it is uh, uh, to be viewed uh, together as the battlefield uh, of resistance. And uh, this is the map of the continent, including uh, uh, Southeast Asia and China. The red portion is quite uh, large, especially Southeast Asia, uh, compared to the Chinese front. It is a big a battlefield, as uh, you can see. So first of all, what I'm going to talk about today is the Operation Ichigo, which is uh, uh, the cross-continent uh, 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 operation. And uh, towards the end of the war, from April 44 to the beginning of the next year, February of the next year, it was uh, deployed. And uh, this is a well-known operation from North China to Indochina. It was to secure uh, the land uh, route and also to occupy the U.S. Air Force base. And, and China, with that, uh, was able uh, to was losing uh, Henan, Guangxi, Guangdong, uh, Fujian, a uh, major part, and also a part of Guizhou. And the Japanese army uh, occupied uh, Hengyang, Wilin, and Liuzhou and uh, attained its uh, objective. However, the U.S. forces uh, shifted its focus of uh, the battle against uh, China from reinforcing the China ground troops to strategic bombing, and that led to the losing of the meaning of Operation Ichigo. Next, I would uh, like to look at the CBI front, and uh, the main uh, operation was the Burma campaign, and in 1944, uh, around the time of Operation Ichigo, this was deployed. It was a major military campaign. And uh, the defense of Burma and uh, the supply route to Chiang Kai-shek's China was to be blocked. And also it was uh, uh, deployed in a vast area of all of Burma, uh, southwest India, uh, northern Thailand, and Hunan province. And uh, uh, Operation Impal from April, uh, March uh, 44 to uh, July 44. And uh, the uh, Sino-Indian route after that was to be blocked. However, uh, the, uh, in the end, the Indochina route is uh, resumed. So uh, around the time that these two operations were deployed, there was, even in the military, uh, the discussion on its merits. 
and uh, the relationship between the two operations and uh, the relationship with the war in the Pacific. Uh, militarily speaking, I think uh, this has uh, 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 been clarified. And uh, there was the exhaustion of supplies and uh, the personnel. And uh, for both operations, there were opportunities to discontinue. And it was discussed at the Imperial headquarters, too. However, uh, both operations were continued. and after the war became a target of uh, criticism. And so uh, the report today is going to focus not on uh, the right or wrong or merits of the two operations, but rather that these two operations not only incurred uh, major uh, human and material damages, but rather uh, various conditions uh, overlapped, and uh, that led to uh, unintended uh, impact uh, to post-war uh, 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 China, Japan, and Asia. And first, uh, with regards to Operation Ichigo, and uh, I think this is uh, quite well known, the KMT forces uh, uh, defeat uh, that uh, had a big uh, damage to the nationalist government. And uh, the uh, scope of control uh, was halved, and they lost important areas such as Hunan. And not just uh, uh, direct uh, material and human losses, rather, uh, lots of uh, war refugees were uh, produced. And there was also. Not just the human losses, these uh, refugees, and also uh, there was uh, uh, the uh, rampant inflation so that it transformed Chinese society and the political and social conditions advantageous to the development of communist uh, forces uh, uh, was uh, um, seen. And uh, there was a the loss of the uh, KMT troops and uh, uh, the requisitioning of food and uh, uh, also uh, forced conscription were seen to make up for this. And then, secondly, uh, with regards to the uh, dictatorial structure of the Nationalist uh, Party, there was strong criticism. And that led to the uh, widespread uh, democratization uh, movement called the Second Constitutional Movement. And also, the fall from power of the uh, KMT also meant the rise of the communists. And uh, this uh, crisis uh, domestically also had uh, effect outside China. and. Uh, the sense of crisis uh, was seen on the U.S. side, and they wanted to rebuild the Chinese uh, front, and uh, therefore they wanted to unify command under uh, General Stilwell and also uh, mediate uh, between the KMT and the Communist Party. But Chiang Kai-shek did not accept this, and the plans were frustrated. And this is uh, well known as the incident where Stilwell was dismissed. Now here, uh, so Operation Ichigo also had repercussions on Japan. And uh, the defeat of the KMT forces and the rise of the communist forces brought about the uh, change in the perception of the Japanese government towards uh, the communist forces. In the second half of 1944, the Yan'an government, that is the communist uh, forces, uh, uh, were uh, recognized, and th the uh, pro-communist policy was put forth. And uh, with the pro-communist policy, uh, the target was to draw <coughs> Yang and the Soviet Union to the Japanese side. And from the latter part of 1944, Soviet uh, entry into the war was a concern, so it was considered effective to prevent this. That is, 
the UN and government and the Soviet Union were closely related and therefore Soviet Union could be utilized. Uh, so it was a political offensive. And also externally speaking, this pro-communist policy of Japan also had an impact on Japan. And this is well known. Uh, Fumimaro Kone, who is a former prime minister, uh, made an address to the emperor and it was uh, connected to the sense of crisis in Japan about communist expansion and uh, led to two theories on peace. One is that to avoid uh, the uh, communism in Japan, there should be an exploration of peace with the US and the UK, which is uh, what uh, Konoe was saying. And then assuming that uh, the uh, communist penetration would be uh, tolerated to an extent, uh, there was uh, p consideration of peace mediated aided by the Soviet Union. And these two peace theories do both did not bear fruit. In other words, uh, this pro-communist policy was not to be accepted as a national policy on the side of Japan. Uh, and uh, the end of the war with the final condition being protection of the emperor system meant the start of an anti-communist nation. And so uh, this uh, uh, pro-communist uh, stance was just a convenient compromise uh, on the part of the Japanese government to prevent the entry into war by the Soviet Union. Eventually, Kuomintang army suffered debacle, which created conditions that would determine the future outlook of national order in East Asia. And when the weight of the Chinese Communist Party uh, became more important in uh, the war against Japan, and at the same time, uh, that created the condition uh, for uh, as an uh, advantageous condition for Communist Party uh, within the uh, conflict uh, between Kuomintang and Communist Party, and also uh, the the U.S. United States also lost its expectation toward Kuomintang in terms of its governance, and thus, uh, as uh, the partner, they uh, placed more expectation toward uh, Soviet Union rather than China as a partner to fight against uh, Japan. And for Chiang Kai-shek, uh, the interest on Yojun Tairan, uh, the Chinese Eastern and South Manchurian Railway were granted uh, to the Soviet Union at the Yalta Conference by the United States and United Kingdom. Uh, that uh, was a strong disappointment uh, for Chiang Kai-shek for future uh, the, the plan after the war. With the rise of communist uh, influence in northern part of China, when the uh, influence of Soviet Union in northern part of China was recognized internationally, that meant that uh, the partnership with Japan became essential uh, to stand against uh, the Communist Party. In other words, uh, toward the end of the war, the relationship between Japan and Kuomintang government was no longer the relationship between uh, the victor nation versus a defeated nation, but rather it was considered as uh, the friendly relationship to fight against a common enemy that is a communist uh, the army. And uh, that is reflected in the uh, acceptance of the surrender document uh, between Japanese army and Kuomintang army. And on the other hand, in the southeastern Asia, the, the Kuomintang government also sent its army to CBI uh, the front to uh, counter the Japanese army. And uh, it was said that they made a significant contribution in terms of uh, the the achieve, uh, realizing the access uh, the between mainland China and India and Burma. And according to some study in spring 1942, uh, the during Burma operation, uh, the the British and Chinese army was defeated heavily. That was not because of the uh, military uh, predominance of Japanese army, but rather was because of the Kuomintang army that was viewed 
as uh, the enemy by the Burmese Independence Army, the uh, to Burmese uh, eyes, uh, the Kuomintang Army was uh, viewed as uh, the uh, the the army siding with uh, the British, with whom the Burmese were fighting for, and uh, the together with the uh, anti-Japanese uh, war, the anti-fascist uh, the United Front was. Uh, the definition of the Burma operation, and uh, therefore, uh, the the rivalry between China and uh, the UK was not included uh, uh, as a viewpoint uh, for over the communist, uh, or rather, the colonialism, and uh, the rivalry of the colonialism. Uh, emerged uh, after the war when Japanese armies started to spread into Southeast Asia, and that uh, the together with that the Kuomintang army was deeply involved in, uh, together with the UK and US, and the uh, as during the, the 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 war the Allied nations started to plan for the uh, the post-war order uh, after uh, Japan. Uh, Leaves Asia, and uh, then uh, the there was not much difference in terms of the views on international order after the war in East Asia between Kuomintang and other allied nations. However, in Southeast Asia, the the plan f after the war was not in complete agreement between Kuomintang government and allied nations because uh, the when Japan leaves, uh, that would uh, leave uh, that would give the room for uh, the the suzerain nations such as uh, UK and France to come back uh, into Asia. And such differences uh, of views and interests among the allied nations were also reflected in the way the Kuomintang uh, government was involved in the uh, Southeast Asia. The Chiang Kai-shek and Foreign Affairs Ministry uh, focused more on cooperation with the United Kingdom, and therefore they were quite cautious in terms of the operation uh, of its army in Southeast Asia, as well as in the case of the army and uh, the, those uh, the, the divisions that were sent to uh, for expedition. They, they were more interested in cooperation with a local uh, population, and they wanted to support independence uh, in uh, the, uh, those colonialized uh, territories. And in fact, for Chiang Kai-shek, uh, the active support uh, to people that was uh, repressed, that were oppressed, and the guidance of them or leading them were part of the uh, important uh, the post-war plan by Chiang Kai-shek. And in that sense, they, there was an agreement with uh, what was uh, embraced by uh, President uh, Roosevelt. However, he died in April 1945, and as a result, uh, the independence of Indochina through a trusteeship uh, was uh, postponed, and the, the President Truman uh, recognized uh, and accepted the return of uh, the British and uh, French uh, into Southeast Asia, and Kuomintang government uh, the registered uh, the return of France and was interested in supporting independence of Indochina people. And Long Yuan in Yunnan resisted strongly against the French uh, for coming back to Vietnam, and uh, they considered that was the uh, the major obstacle to restore the governance of Indochina and placed uh, the pressure on central government, and thus the rift between central and local governments uh, became deeper. In conclusion, Looking at the ways uh, the wars were fought uh, by China and Japan in two fronts, they highlighted a broad range of challenges that the China uh, was eventually facing with after the war. And in fact, against as a backdrop to that, the communism, nationalism, and colonialism, and those three factors were confounding with each other, which eventually developed into the uh, common challenge for the entire Asia after the war. And in fact, the impact of uh, Sino-Japan War uh, was spread all over Asia, but uh, uh, the the framework to uh, look at that 
is not just bilateral relationship between uh, the Japanese invasion. Japanese invasion versus patriots, but rather it should be viewed from global, uh, the multilateral framework, especially the communism, nationalism, colonialism, those three uh, defined uh, the post-war Asia, and they were interacting with each other and affected uh, the policies by the United States, including Korean War and Vietnam War. In fact, I would say that uh, the, the origins of those wars uh, date back to the time when those uh, three concepts were interacting with each other. And uh, from 2001 to 2015, the six international conferences uh, took place on uh, international joint study of Sino-Japan War. More than 1,000 uh, the members participated in those uh, conferences, and uh, the, what I reported to you today reflects uh, what was discussed uh, there. And the, I'd like to point out that uh, there were a lot of uh, studies uh, that were presented at those conferences uh, centering uh, around Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hatano. Operation Ichigo and the Burma campaign. These were two major campaigns, and uh, at the time, for the nationalist government, uh, there was a big effect. And it's not just uh, a Sino-Japanese relation, but uh, it was a bigger international arena. And I think it leads to the post-war cold structure in East Asia, and I believe that uh, uh, we see such a structure. And uh, with Operation Ichigo, well, Japan did have a series of victories. And it was it led to the rise of the Communist Party and also the presence of Soviet Union. And also the trust to Chongqing on the US side uh, was uh, uh, decreasing. And Chiang Kai-shek also had interest in India, and he was against the colonialism by Britain. And especially with regards to Southeast Asia, he showed uh, this posture. And uh, so communism, colonialism, I think uh, these are uh, key words in post-war East Asia. And uh, you see the starting point uh, in the uh, end, towards the end of the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, aggression and uh, resistance, uh, that uh, view is not sufficient. Thank you very much. So now we'd like to hear from the discussants. And uh, we would like to ask uh, first uh, Professor Iwatani, please. So is uh, my screen being shared? Thank you very much. Well, it's not such a uh, big slide, but uh, uh, I'm from Hokkaido University, and uh, my name is Iwatani, and uh, I am an expert on the political history in uh, modern uh, China. And uh, with regards to Dr. Huang, I'd like to ask about the Chinese side, and I'd like to ask about the Japanese side to uh, Professor Hatano. I have uh, 10 minutes, uh, limited time. And so with regards to the critique, Professor Kawashima already has uh, given a concise uh, uh, summary. And therefore, I would just like to ask some questions, first of all, to uh, Dr. Huang. Now, thank you for the very meaningful uh, presentation. And with detailed analysis, I think uh, uh, the fact that uh, the uh, effects of the uh, Anne Rangwai uh, policy uh, differed. And I was listening to your report, and I have uh, two questions to ask. Uh, that is, 
First is uh, with regards to the Chiang Kai-shek's view of uh, Soviet Union at the time of this NA Rangwai policy. And uh, in your report, Dr. Huang, you talked about uh, Japan's uh, policy toward uh, uh, China uh, and also the uh, movement of the Japan-Soviet relationship. And uh, at the, uh, also, on the other hand, how did uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, understand uh, the Soviet Union at this time? And also, uh, I don't think uh, you touched too much on uh, the uh, NA uh, uh, Rangwai uh, rang policy on the Soviet Union, so I'd like to know about that. As far as I know, around 1929, Chiang Kai Shek had already been using uh, this uh, uh, word of uh, Nai Rangwai. And at that time, more than Rangwai, Nai was uh, the focus of his uh, attention. And this uh, word is uh, strongly linked to Rangwai. Uh, uh, in terms of the timing, is probably around the time of the Wan Sha incident where ethnic Korean settlers and local Chinese former farmers uh, had uh, clashed. And after that time, uh, with the Kwantan army, the Manchurian incident occurs, and then the uh, uh, Rangwai is clearly now is uh, talking about Japan. However, in May of 1933, there is the Tenku truce, and uh, a certain end comes to the Manchurian incident. And after that time, uh, the vigilance of uh, Chiang Kai-shek towards Japan does uh, retreat into the background uh, somewhat. And uh, uh, in that place, uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, uh, becomes wary of the Soviet Union. And in June, on June 20th, 20th uh, 1933, if you look at his diary, he talks about the diplomatic relation with Japan, Russia, uh, US, and UK. And he says that uh, the Japanese uh, pirates, that is Japan, resent uh, China. However, it also is afraid of China. Therefore, it is possible to have some uh, relationship with uh, uh, Japan. Uh, uh, the Red Russia, Communist Russia, is uh, Chinese enemy, and they uh, resent uh, China. And their objective is not only to overthrow, but to destroy China. And the US-UK is using China for its own benefit. And they are trying to restrain Japan and Russia, but they are not uh, ambitious territorially. Therefore, we can see the US and UK as companions. And Japan is uh, just a country with a grudge. And it, Red Russia is the only enemy nation for China. And if you look at the diary on July 7th, it says that uh, uh, Japan, uh, uh, that the uh, 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 trouble of Japan is uh, uh, sudden, and of Russia, it is very slow. However, uh, the size of the uh, damage is bigger for Russia and smaller for Japan. And in the background is the fact that uh, there was the Xinjiang issue and also uh, Feng Yushan's uh, uh, assistance to the Chinese Communist Party. And on the other hand, uh, against Japan, if you look at the diary on August 2nd, it says that uh, we have to be careful in the friendly relationship uh, with Japan in terms of diplomacy. And if you look at uh, uh, Huang Hu's uh, diary, uh, in the Lushan conference on August, in August 1933, he says that the following was determined, that is, in terms of uh, foreign affairs, it would be directed at Soviet Union, and uh, Japan, US, and UK will be used. And if you look at it in this way, at this time, Chiang Kai-shek, in his mind, was more wary of uh, Soviet Union than Japan. And also, uh, this uh, uh, vigilance or sense of crisis against the Soviet Union was not temporary. Rather, it was very serious. And uh, therefore, uh, the uh, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, perception of Soviet Union at the time of the Anne Rangwai, how should we view it? And also, uh, what is the Soviet factor in the Anne Rangwai uh, policy? How should we understand that? That's my first question. Second question. That is, uh, uh, during the uh, Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, the uh, Song Zeng Yuan's moves and Chiang Kai-shek's attitude. And according to Dr. Fun, at the time of the Marco Polo Bridge incident, the Japanese government and Song Zeng Yuan had uh, been relatively satisfied with the situation. And it was the nationalist government and the Tianjin army which had dissatisfaction. And uh, Fang Wu uh, departed, and uh, Song Zeng Yuan uh, became the mediator between Japan and China in North China. and. 
uh, for uh, the uh, nationalist government and Chiang Kai-shek, uh, it became more difficult to control uh, North China. And immediately after the incident, uh, the four divisions uh, were sent northward. It was communicated to Song Zeng Wen that uh, he would uh, give full support. And uh, this was uh, also reported outside China through the media. However, uh, the military officers uh, of uh, US, uh, UK, and uh, France and uh, Germany had uh, investigated and it found out that Chiang Kai-shek had just concentrated local forces in Hebei and the elite central forces uh, were not uh, uh, sent. And uh, so Song Zhe won and uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, 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 Song, uh, uh, the one thought that uh, only the 29th Army was to uh, fight uh, with Japan. And uh, this is because he had past experience uh, during the defense of the Great Wall in 1933, and uh, the 29th Army was not uh, dispatched at that time, too. And it was just the local forces. And so uh, compared to the second Shanghai incident in, in 1937, uh, the uh, fall of Beiping and, and Jin up until the fall of Bay and Tianjin, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, behavior, compared to what he said, uh, was not uh, very decisive. Rather, it was uh, rather indecisive. And uh, he was, uh, uh, seems that uh, he was leaving uh, the uh, handling of the Kwantan army after the Manchurian incident to Zhang Ziling and the Northeast Army, basically. And uh, uh, therefore, he wanted to reduce the power of both sides. Uh, can we say that? Next, uh, with regards to the uh, Professor Hadana, I'd like to ask a question. And it was an uh, in-depth report, and therefore I haven't been able to grasp the entire picture. However, uh, my, from the viewpoint of my personal research, I would like to ask you about Japanese Army's view of the Communist Party around the time of the Operation Ichigo. And as you said, with the diversion of the Japanese forces in North China to the south, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, forces in North China had been weakened, and with the implementation of Operation Ichigo, came the forces in Central and South China suffered enormous damages, and because of that, that led to the strengthening of the Communist Army forces. And around that time, the Communist Party had recovered from the crisis in 1942, and uh, the uh, military pressure around Yan'an had uh, become weakened, so some troops were sent south, and uh, they are able to expand their forces. And also in middle China, there was exchange of view information with the um, American uh, military, and their presence was being felt. And uh, the uh, growth of their forces in Operation Ichigo uh, was just an opportunity to recover from a moribund state, and it should be distinguished from the military development uh, after the war between uh, during the Civil War. At any rate, it is true that the Communist Party did recover and expand at that time, especially there was the North China Area Army forming the Special Security Forces and paying attention to their moves, and uh, the focus was to prevent the expansion of uh, their forces. On the other hand, the Chinese Expeditionary Army uh, at the time of the Operation Ichigo uh, did not seem to pay too much attention uh, to the communist forces, and rather at that time, it, the uh, diplomatic approach to the Soviet Union and appeasing attitude towards the Communist Party had not started. And if the Nationalist Party troops uh, were weakened, then the uh, Communist Party could uh, take advantage of that. Uh, to expand their forces, uh, but uh, uh, significant measures were not taken. Is it because uh, they didn't have enough uh, reserve uh, strength, or is it something else? And also in connection with that, China Expeditionary Army and the uh, Japanese North China Area Army, uh, is there any discrepancy in their view towards the Communist Party in terms of the judgment of the situation and the policy of dealing with the Communist Party? That's all from my side. Thank you very much. So two questions to Dr. Wan and two to Dr. Hatano. Now uh, over to you, Dr. Mori. Thank you very much. I am Mori of Doshisha University. On my part, First, I'd like to share the screen with you. I also have questions, two questions to Dr. Wen. 
And also two questions to Dr. Hachano. As was introduced, my specialty is Japanese political diplomacy history. And therefore, after hearing a quite informative presentations by two speakers, I, it, I think uh, uh, the I may have to overstretch my knowledge in commenting on that. The, we see various studies and the progress or the development uh, that uh, eventually led to Sino-Japan War, especially from Chinese history's point of view. As a backdrop, the there was the uh, the, the 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 publishing of the diary by Chiang Kai-shek. And also, uh, we see the uh, the international interest on a Sino-Japan War. Therefore, for those uh, that are studying uh, the Japanese uh, political diplomacy history, the question is how to reconcile the recent development with what I have been studying. First, uh, to uh, the presentation by Dr. Wan. Uh, he explained to us about uh, the uh, the very steps that were followed by Chiang Kai-shek uh, that eventually led to the war, as well as the background. And uh, based upon my studies on Japanese political diplomacy history, as is well known, uh, the, on the part of the uh, Japanese army, they strongly denied the Chiang Kai-shek and according to what I heard, it appears that Chiang Kai-shek was actually very flexible in terms of his views toward Japan. Therefore, the question is why the Japanese army could not uh, fully interpret and understand uh, such a uh, flexible attitude on the part of Chiang Kai-shek and ignored his presence. And thus, uh, my first question is as follows. The about information analysis uh, that uh, constituted the backdrop of uh, the determining the policy uh, by Chiang Kai-shek. When Chiang Kai-shek tried to project uh, the actions by Japan, it appears that uh, he mainly analyzed um, the actions by the armies, Japanese armies dispatched to continent China, as well as uh, the the some of the uh, armies, for instance. Uh, there was a view about the, the new puppet regime that was uh, to be established. And thus, I'd like to know how Chiang Kai-shek understood and made a judgment on decisions, actions, and plans by the government, the army headquarters, the Navy, and Foreign Affairs Ministry. The, I had an opportunity to study uh, the embassies in Japan as well as or Japanese embassies as well and the consulate and analyze the reports that were produced by the uh, diplomats. I wanted to know to what extent uh, such analysis uh, by diplomats were reflected in the decisions made by Chiang Kai-shek. Second question, uh, from late 1936 to early 1937, that we saw the rise of uh, the renewed uh, views uh, toward China in Japan and how it was evaluated by Chiang Kai-shek. In January 1937, Senjiro Hayashi administration was the instituted, and according to Foreign Minister Naotake Sato, in place of uh, the, uh, the coercive diplomacy, he uh, intended to uh, wipe away uh, the, uh, the plan for dividing China, and yet uh, the, he th had a strong will that uh, he could not uh, the compromise Manchuria. I wonder whether such uh, diplomacy by uh, Minister Sato 
had、uh, any chance of improving the relationship between Japan and China, even on a temporary basis. And now turning to Dr. Hajano, I have some comments to make. According to Dr. Hajano, who is, of course, the leading expert in the studies of Sino Japan war, and also he has a background of undertaking studies on various topics. And Operation Ichigo and the, through the, and the campaign in Burma, I believe there were two important points that should be highlighted. That is, to look at those two operations from a global point of view. The other is about、uh, the, the, the connection, the continuity with the Cold War. And thus, I have a questions, two questions really, to Dr. Hatano on his report. First, this is somewhat overlapping with what Dr. Iwatani already mentioned. That is, the fall of the Kuomintang Party and the rise of communists and their impact after the war. How it was recognized and understood by Japan, the government of Japan, and the Japanese army. That is, despite the fact that the Kuomintang army was、uh, suffering debacle and the rise of the Communist Party, yet uh, the, uh, the army that was dispatched to China was engaged in the Battle of West Hunan and Lao He Ko operation. In 1945, April to、uh, June, especially,、uh, the commander Okamura was、uh, insisting on the aggression toward the Kuomintang Party. It doesn't appear that he understood the importance of the impact of、uh, the, those two in, the factors that I have just mentioned. In other words, The government of Japan back then, or Japanese army, could not uh, the project uh, their impact, or they did not, or they just ignored、uh, the impact of those two elements about the influence of Kuomintang and communists. And I'd like to ask、uh, the, the question that is about. Uh, the, the development after the war, the, during the Cold War, I was greatly impressed uh, with uh, his uh, discussion on Southeast Asia. I'd like to know the Kuomintang Party that was、uh, left behind in Southeast Asia was positioned in what way by the、uh, resistance and continent after the war? The, In other words, how influential such,、uh, the residual Kuomintang Party in Southeast Asia was, and、uh, whether they continue to maintain the communication with Chiang Kai shek Kuomintang government or not. And also, some time later, the, it is widely known that、uh, the former Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida had、uh, the, the plan for uh, revisiting. Uh, The Southeast Asia and eventually influencing back to China, and whether there was any、uh, relationship between his concept and uh, the, uh, the Kuomintang Party that was left in Southeast Asia. So,、uh, two questions to Dr. Huang about post war、uh, China, and also a question to Professor Hatano. And、uh, first, we'd like to hear、uh, the replies from Dr. Huang. And then we'll have a discussion. Thank you for the comments by the two speakers.、Uh, first,、uh, with regards to Professor Iwatani, Chiang Kai shek's view, as far as I understand,、uh, his view of、uh, Soviet Union has to also be viewed with this、uh, Communist Party that is around the 1930s. The, it was a time when, well, Uh, so the time of eliminating the communists uh, uh, were seen and then not seen. And 
of course. He was very uh, vigilant about the Soviet Union, but with regards to Communist Party, Uh, uh, well, while he was focused on the Communist Party, his uh, threat uh, perception of the Soviet Union was lowered. And uh, before 1936 with uh, Japan, he was thinking about uh, fighting with the Soviet Union. And after that time, the expectation was that if there's war with Japan, then how can they get assistance from the Soviet Union? After the Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, it, that was my view. Uh, um, and secondly, about uh, Chiang Kai-shek's, uh, it's true that there was uh, a mistrust. And this is with regards to the uh, relationship with the uh, Song Zeyuan, but uh, the Japanese armies uh, uh, would be used, and uh, uh, Song Se Yuan's uh, uh, force. Well, uh, I don't think he was thinking that far. And after the Marco Polo Bridge incident, the Central of Horses went to the Mukden, and and uh, uh, if you did not uh, reinforce up to that point, then. Well, he wanted to avoid uh, the confrontation with Japan. And uh, Professor Mori asked two questions. And basically, uh, KMT uh, bureaucrats uh, studied in the uh, Japanese army schools. So they had a strong pipe and uh, not so much uh, links with uh, China, and therefore, the understanding was centering on the army. And secondly, if you look at Chiang Kai-shek, he had uh, good ties with Sayonji Kimimochi and also not uh, such bad contact with Araki. And so uh, between uh, the Japanese government and the military, well, uh, uh, the Japanese government uh, uh, how to protect the emperor system was uh, what was uh, emphasized. And however, the forces in China, well, you have the Japanese troops in China, and there is a, a factional uh, a confrontation. In other words, uh, that struggle would be used collectively. In other words, the dispatched uh, uh, forces. Uh, he would, did not have a consistent policy towards them, and it was all uh, related to the internal uh, uh, situation within the Japanese forces. There was mistrust towards the Japan, and uh, uh, there was a grudge that was uh, uh, seen. And then in 1937, how do you evaluate diplomacy? The Japanese problem, or the dispatch forces in uh, uh, China, uh, was not uh, well controlled. Therefore, he did not have uh, too much expectations for diplomacy. And so there was not a sense of crisis. And in that sense, he did not have a very strong sense of crisis. Thank you. Now, Dr. Hachano, please. Thank you for the questions. There were some commonalities between the questions by those two experts. It was the, 
the rise of communist forces around Operation Ichigo, or put it differently, that was about declining uh, the Kuomintang Party, the Kuomintang Army, and about the rise of communist for Japanese army, how did they recognize the rise of uh, the communist army? That's the gist of the question. And to me, not only uh, the army, but also the government has to be taken into consideration. And there are three levels that we should look at that implication. First, at the government level, the Japanese government level, and then the operation that was undertaken by the army uh, that was dispatched to China, which was responsible for the operation in China. And then there was a group that was always in contact with uh, the uh, communist guerrilla, that is the, the division that was sent to uh, the northern part of China. First, in the case of the government, about the rise of China, uh, the Communist Party, especially in 1944, that was eventually communicated to Japan. And in view of that, they tried to look at that uh, information in the context of the Soviet Union. That is, the Communist and the Soviet Union were viewed as those that are affecting with each other, especially due to the influence of the Soviet Union. The Chinese communist would take independent actions due to the influence by the Soviet Union. And then the in the case of armies that were locally dispatched, uh, the army that was dispatched to China in view of a rise of communist forces, communist army, as Dr. Mori pointed out, For the division that was sent to northern China, in view of the guerrillas, in fact, uh, the, the, the army that was sent to northern China uh, was uh, entirely responsible for dealing with a guerrilla. And therefore, if for entire army that was dispatched to China, how they viewed the presence of communist army and how they predicted uh, their uh, influence after the war, I don't think they thought about the question very seriously. And then there was a part of army that was always in contact with uh, the, the guerrillas, uh, namely uh, the division that was uh, dispatched to northern China to them. The influence of communists, I, I don't say that uh, they were ser seriously analyzing the impact and influence of uh, the communist army in northern China, especially after the war, the influence that eventually uh, they demonstrated after the war, that was it was never thought uh, after by the uh, the Japanese army, especially the uh, the that was the the view that was held by the uh, the the guarding uh, soldiers that were fighting against guerrilla and communist army, and therefore, I don't think there was much difference between the policy held by the Central Army versus uh, the army in northern China that was engaged in the guerrilla war. That is, the source of the influence and power of a communist and its future development to the army that was sent to China. The eventual development and possibility of development of communist army was uh, never considered uh, by 
the Japanese army that was dispatched to China. But after the war, various evaluations came out. And eventually, the views by Japan toward the communist influence may be a little bit uh, they inflated, but they don't have any other factors, elements uh, to deny uh, the influence. And also, uh, the Kuomintang Party that was left behind in Southeast Asia, the, the guerrilla uh, group, And uh, they became the 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 group uh, that eventually tried to strike back. And especially after the Korean War, the United States tried to tolerate or support uh, that uh, the guerrilla group. And after Korean War, from the point of view of stability of Southeast Asia, the guerrillas in Yunnan. were under pressure uh, to leave that region. Thus, as uh, the major force to strike back toward the continent, demonstrated by guerrillas in Yunnan, eventually failed. And also, about the scope and magnitude of uh, such a group in Yunnan, well, not just the group in Yunnan, but the uh, expedition, expeditionary army, what was the size of the army that was uh, left behind eventually in Southeast Asia and Yunnan? It is rather difficult to quantify that. But from Japanese point of view, we estimate that the total number was about 300,000 out of which how many were left in Southeast Asia or Yunnan to be the major party to strike back against uh, the continent China, uh, the not much analysis has been performed. And at the same time, I refer to Shigeru Yoshida, who was in interested in penetrating into China from Southeast Asia, whether there was any relationship between the two, no, I have to say I don't know. I don't have sufficient knowledge to answer that. And if I may add, I briefly touched on the Japanese government and their policy to tolerate uh, communist or pro-communist uh, the policy. And some say that that is somewhat um, overvalued. But when we consider the process of how such pro-communist uh, the, the policy was born, it was around spring 1944. Manabu Sano of Japanese Communist Party contacted uh, the headquarters And then convey that information that uh, the communist uh, forces are now considered to be significant enough to be recognized. Uh, that is a message uh, sent by Mr. Sano to the general staff office. And eventually, that uh, led to formation of pro-communist uh, policy. So Operation Ichigo and the uh, defeat of Kuomintang Army were the origin of uh, the development of such pro-communist uh, policy. So in that context, I refer to the policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. So about the mobile squad during the Korean War, MacArthur went to Chinese Taipei and uh, met Chiang Kai-shek and uh, 
Chiang Kai-shek said that he wants to use the mobile squad to pressure uh, uh, the uh, communists, but uh, it seems that uh, MacArthur did not uh, uh, agree. And uh, in Burma and Thailand, it seems uh, there were such groups. And then Chiang Kai-shek's policy changed. And so they would uh, uh, go to uh, Chinese Taipei. And so you see such uh, uh, Burma uh, uh, villages uh, in uh, uh, around Taipei. And uh, later we'd like to ask Dr. Huan uh, to perhaps uh, respond now. We would like to entertain questions from the floor. And uh, we have received uh, six questions. And uh, I would like to perhaps uh, not in the order that came in, ask questions from Ambassador Hara. North uh, China problem, and then uh, from Manchurian incident to Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, the Kwantan uh, forces uh, advanced to China. And as a result, uh, they uh, were left to solve uh, issues on their own. And so uh, Tokyo and Japanese government uh, would, uh, after the fact, uh, give their approval. And a uh, question to Dr. Huang. So uh, like the Japanese government, especially in North China, there were the military uh, cliques that uh, were not controlled. And the military clique leaders, uh, uh, they were against the Japanese forces, and that could not be controlled. And so uh, the, uh, th because that could not be controlled, uh, basically, uh, the Japanese uh, government uh, needs to be criticized. And also on uh, the uh, KMT side, uh, they also are responsible in that they could not control those uh, military cliques. And also from uh, uh, Kaneko-san, uh, Son Zeyuan was abandoned. And in North China, uh, Uh, you talked about the Song Zhe Yuan, and if, uh, with regards to the Song Zhe Yuan, if they were not abandoned and uh, continued to be supported, uh, then was there a possibility of compromise between Japan and China? And uh, uh, Dr. Huan, would you answer? Thank you very much. I personally, with regards to North China issue, I think it's different from Manchuria. And Ambassador Hara, yes, uh, for Manchuria, I can agree, uh, but. Uh, at that time in Manchuria, there was uh, the, the authority was not uh, uh, admitted, and that was a big reason for the Manchurian incident. And uh, perhaps there would not have been a confrontation between the military cliques and Japan. Then, from that aspect, I personally do not think that the KMT government is responsible. And uh, in the case of uh, Kaneko-san, basically around 1937, uh, Chiang Kai-shek did not intend to fight with Japan at that time. And so you have the uh, Hebe Chahar Council. And at that time, uh, there was not uh, uh, the view that uh, it would be such a, a large uh, war. And this is a question from Yamada-san, who is listening to the lectures. It's not just uh, between Japan and China, but rather uh, there is the uh, complex uh, situation of the civil strife, and then uh, the civil war becomes uh, full scale. And what about the uh, direct and indirect uh, impact of US and Soviet Union, uh, be it uh, the KMT or the communist? Uh, did the Chinese side uh, involve the other countries in Burma campaign? Uh, uh, post war and uh, uh, what kind of uh, impact did it have on uh, the diplomacy of Japan and about the tie up uh, uh, between uh, Japan and Southeast Asia and also the re advance in the 1950s of Japan to Southeast Asia? Is there a 
impact on this? Well, both are difficult questions. And can you hear me? Yes, we can. So the civil strife between the communists and KMT, what kind of impact If we look at the Sino-Japanese war broadly, what kind of impact did it have? And especially in the process of the civil strife, were other countries uh, uh, becoming I involved? And I am not very detailed on this, but uh, probably involving other countries in that sense, the United States. How did it try to engage itself? And in such a situation, for example, there is the Chinese white paper. And this Chinese white paper looks at the mediation process and the process of the civil strife. And how should I put it? The nationalist government defeat the damage here is emphasized. And uh, against this, there are uh, positions that do not agree. But as I said earlier, uh, the colonialism, nationalism, and communism, I talked about those uh, uh, three. And of the three factors in the civil strife, which in the civil war, what was the factor that influenced the uh, civil war? Well, actually, this is a rather difficult matter. And it's not so much military intervention, but uh, a rather ideological intervention in that sense. I think uh, this should be studied. Also, what was the other question? The other question? The other question? Uh, the Asia strategy of Japan, the post war. That is, uh, what is the impact on Japan's Asia policy? Yes. The Sino-Japanese War, how to resolve this? It was a big issue for Japan for a long time. And uh, the resolution of the Sino-Japanese War, what exactly does it mean? Actually, it was not very clear. And so Operation Ichigo especially in terms of uh, military resolution, the advance into Chongqing was pursued to the end. Even after Operation Ichigo, as Professor Mori mentioned earlier, there was the Operation uh, Chongqing, which was uh, studied by uh, Commander Okada. And uh, so uh, to hit uh, Chongqing militarily, and in terms of diplomacy, there is a so-called new policy uh, towards uh, China and the uh, implementation of this policy. Uh, that is, uh, this uh, was for to support Wang Jingwei, but there was inflation, and uh, Wang Jingwei government does not grow. And so towards the end of the war for Japan, The means to resolve the Sino-Japanese war is lost. And in Southeast Asia, the operation in Southeast Asia in, uh, was uh, to uh, make up for this. In other words, the independent forces in Southeast Asia, including India, would be supported. And then by so doing, post-war, there could be a certain influence retained. A certain uh, influence uh, was to be retained in Asia, uh, that is, that overcoming colonialism in Asia, a certain position could be built. And that was the view of the uh, Great uh, East Asia Council. 
and uh, there was such impact to to engage and in Southeast Asia, in Asia, and uh, to confront the independence and uh, to uh, provide a certain independence. I think uh, it had the meaning uh, as I had just explained. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have more questions. Next question to Dr. Wan. This is a question by Ambassador Togo. According to you, uh, Shanghai Sec was the focusing more on stability internally until the uh, Japan-Russia war uh, broke out. But uh, in 1938, uh, the Battle of Lake Kasan uh, broke out, followed by the uh, No Mon Han incidents in 1939. And the eventually, the Japan was defeated. That led to uh, Japan-USSR neutrality pact. And uh, how this uh, the series of events were viewed by Chiang Kai-shek, and also the, what was the view by Chiang Kai-shek uh, toward the relationship between Japan and China, uh, Germany uh, in terms of uh, defending against uh, communism? At the time of the, the Marco Polo Bridge incident, the Chiang Kai-shek uh, they expected that the USSR was willing to fight with them to stand against uh, Japan and uh, that he was expected that he was expecting that the USSR would eventually uh, declare war against uh, Japan but then uh, the there was the battle of lake kasan and he was expecting that there would be the the the, the development that would be more advantageous to China. But then after No Mon Han incident, uh, the, his view toward USSR changed. Especially the Japanese army moved to Hainan Island. And uh, thus, uh, Chiang Kai-shek hoped that the USSR would not uh, be involved in uh, Japan China war. So he was expecting uh, the United States uh, would be involved in the war against Japan, but uh, the, around 1938, uh, the, the situation was uh, somewhat uh, stable, except for Shanghai and uh, Wuhan and uh, the the those are three locations where the war uh, was uh, fought against Japan. Uh, except for that, there was a stability, and therefore, eventually, he hoped less uh, for the involvement of USSR. But he expected the United States would uh, move forward. And uh, if I put the conclusion first, in view of uh, the communist, uh, the. The, the he had completely different views and attitudes uh, between the Battle of Lake Kasan and No Mon Han incident. And the sort of relationship between Japan and Germany, uh, the relationship uh, became uh, deeper. And uh, the Chiang Kai-shek was somewhat concerned uh, and anxious uh, in view of strengthening relationship between the two. because then there will be a less possibility for Japan to fight against USSR. And also back then, uh, there were German military advisors. And uh, with uh, the, the agreement to fight against communism, the back then, Chiang Kai-shek was interested in retaining the German advisors, but uh, he was quite concerned and anxious. So, Professor Hatano, whether it be the Communist Party or the uh, KMT, uh, it would be there was the uh, t overseas Chinese uh, control and. Uh, 
so the overseas uh, Chinese in Southeast Asia and their presence and uh, to, was, to what extent was it perceived by the US and UK? Because uh, uh, it was a, a kind of a double control and the overseas Chinese control uh, being continued. Well, as suzerains, UK and France uh, wanted to, uh, well, maybe they did not, were not thinking about coming back as suzerains, and that would be all I could say. So Chiang Kai for the Chiang Kai-shek government, uh, there is a remittance from overseas China, Chinese, which is very big. And before Japan, there was also, uh, the trust from the overseas uh, Chinese, and uh, this is with regards to Wan Ching Wei. And uh, thank you very much. I think we can take uh, one or two minutes, and uh, I would like to ask the discussants, Professor Iwatani and Professor Mori, and would you like to make a comment, Professor Iwatani, please? I don't really have anything in particular to say. And Dr. Huang and myself, between us, uh, immediately after the Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, 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 immediately after, uh, there is a certain difference in views. And I think uh, on a personal basis, perhaps we can have a discussion so that uh, we can further analyze uh, uh, the situation. And Professor Mori, please. Also, from my side, I learned a lot from the comments and responses of the two uh, speakers and Dr. Huang's comment. That is, the Japanese government could not control the dispatched forces in China. There are, I think, uh, similar uh, views in the uh, consulates uh, overseas in China and also the Sato diplomacy. I think uh, there was a, a new a view uh, without being able to control the military and, and there was not much expectations. And the Sato diplomacy being uh, positively viewed in the diplomatic history, perhaps uh, we need to subtract from that a bit. And uh, with regards to Professor Hadano's response, the expeditionary force size, uh, Japan viewed it as about 300,000. And for me, 300,000 is a very big force. That's all. Thank you very much. And uh, we don't have time, so we have to stop. But uh, we heard from two wonderful panelists today. And also uh, from the discussants, we got comments that uh, really uh, made the discussion uh, very uh, three-dimensional. And uh, this kind of empirical research is very important. And in the Chinese continent, there is detailed analysis uh, on his diary. And uh, sometimes it's uh, criticized as revisionism. But uh, perhaps there can be a new approach. and. It may not be easy to do such research. Maybe there are some constraints in China, and therefore Japan and Chinese Taipei. I think uh, we need to proceed with this kind of empirical research, and that's probably more important than in the past. And this was a symposium that we wanted to do in Taipei, uh, and so it's being done online. But we hope that uh, this kind of joint research can go forward in this way. And we were able to hear from two wonderful speakers and uh, two wonderful discussants. And I think we had been able to have an in-depth discussion. Thank you very much. And I would now like to return the microphone to the secretariat. Uh, thank you very much. So with that, uh, this uh, webinar on uh, reassessing the Second Sino-Japanese War will come to a close. And please, uh, uh, if you have time, uh,
cooperate in uh, answering our questionnaire. Thank you very much for participating in this webinar despite your busy schedules.